Tonight is September the 11th, 2020, 9-11, 19 years after that uh, terrible event. I worked for uh, on contract with INS at the time, Immigration and Naturalization Services. I'd gone into management for Northrop Grumman on contract with them. I remember that day quite well. But anyway, we survived that and we'll survive this pandemic too. But right now, let's talk about a happier subject, like an SET amplifier. I am having an outright love affair with these things. That uh, one that I built with the uh, 300Bs just sounds fantastic, even at 5 watts. Actually, it does about 6.5 watts at 1% THD, but I rated it at 5. Um, it just it's, it's, it sounds so alive. It's hard to describe. I love it. Anyway, so it has prompted me to build another bigger one. These are some beautiful Svetlana uh, 572-10s as you can see. I got them actually quite cheap because look here, here's here's what they were sold as. I, I made that mark on it. I put the line through the 160 and wrote 10 on it. But they were sold as Svetlana 572-160s. The 160 is the uh, gain of the tube, which is this is, if it were a 160, it would be an 811. But it's not an 811. It's a 10. It's actually marked a 10. And I have very carefully looked inside. I don't know if I can show you or not. But if you can see down inside the tube, if you can look at the grid, I can show you an 811. I've actually got a busted one. You can see the spacing in the grid. And you can see that this is a low gain tube. There's a lot more space between the wires in a low gain tube. Than on a, that in a high gain tube. Let me get a let me get a, a genuine 811 uh, that was that broken, and I and I want to show you what the difference is. Here's an 811 that I was replacing the other day that was actually good, but I bought a a, a beautiful quad uh, NOS ones, truly NOS ones. See this one's actually pretty strong, but as I was trying to get the plate cap off, this broke. Let me, uh, I'm going to take the grid out and I'll, and I'll show you the difference. Okay, here's the actual grid out of that uh, 811. Look how fine and how closely wound uh, the wires on that grid are. Now again, if you look in here, I don't know if you can see in there or not. I, I sure wish you could. But if I can get the, without all that glare on it. You kind of got to have, uh, got to have light. If you can see up in there, there's a lot of space in that grid. So anyway, for whatever this is worth, a um, a triode with uh, a lot of space in the grid with a whole lot less wire on it, the wire wound with, with a lot more space between it makes a low gain tube which is very linear, very inefficient, great tube for running class A. Uh, a tube like this, so you can just ground the grid of this 811 and basically stop the flow of current from the cathode to the plate. If you ground the grid of a low gain tube, you won't stop the flow of current. Uh, if you put high voltage on the plate and ground the cathode and you don't put some bias on it, then you're gonna melt your tube really quick. And look at this one, speaking of melting tubes, this guy right here, look at that poor thing. Man, that thing has been hot, hasn't it? Holy cow, there's like a hole melted in it. I don't think I changed them any time too soon. But anyway, that's this is just an opportunity while I had this thing out here, I had this busted tube to show you the difference between a high gain triode and a low gain triode. The uh, high gain triodes are actually not very good for, uh, for uh, high fidelity stuff because um, well, you can use them as grounded grid amplifiers, and you can get an enormous amount of power out of them. But they're not linear like the uh, the uh, the low gain triodes. This this grid right here, I've I've said this before, gives this tube a gain of 160. But with the uh, the, the grid in the uh, the 572B, that's 572-10s that I'm showing you here, not the 572B. That's another uh, that's another bigger 811. And the 300B, they, the 300B and these 572s 
dash tens have a gain of around 10. Right there, 10. For what it's worth. A good gentleman asked me that when I build amplifiers to point out my approach to it, I made uh, some comments on it before, but I physically just lay it out like I'm doing right here. And uh, once I get what I want, then I start marking them. I use a, um, a square so that, you know, things are symmetrical. Uh, you got to have a lot of tools. I've been asked about tools. Here's something I got the other day that you might find kind of interesting. I'm always looking for uh, more high quality uh, nippers, you know, diagonal cutters. These were advertised on Amazon. And these are actually t uh, nail clippers. And I saw they were cutting wire like it was uh, string. And I said, yeah, I got to have some of those. These things are good. Yeah, they're on Amazon right now. I think they're like 15 bucks. Now I've got, you know, legitimate uh, tools like this that I've had for many years. I've had, I don't know how long I've had these 20 years. You can tell that, you know, they, <laughs> things get melted every once in a while. But you, you got to have a lot of tools, in particular cutters and, and tough things, you know. Actually, these old tools are, some of them are really darn good. These old tools made back in the 50s and 60s are made out of some of the hardest steel I've ever seen. As far as parts go, these types of parts, see this one's kind of rusty. I think I'll have to polish it up, either that or use. Actually, I might just use these. I prefer to use U.S. parts. I don't know if you can read that or not, but it says uh, National. Uh, Was it Madeline, Massachusetts, USA? You know, I, have, I am not here to bash Chinese parts or equipment in any way. Thank God they're still there or, you know, we wouldn't have any vacuum tubes. Them and the Russians. Because uh, I guess the EPA and the, the money, the cost and the, the pollution, I don't know what it is why we can't build them over here. I guess just a simple cost. You know, 12X7 probably cost $350 made in the U.S. It probably wouldn't be any better either. Anyway, it's just my opinion. But I do prefer the older USA parts. When you think about it from probably the end of World War II until the end of the Cold War, so somewhere in the 1940s, World War II ended in 1945, but some of the World War II stuff built from, say, the 40s until about 1990. We had 50 years in there of building a lot of equipment, and uh, these parts made in the USA are just very, very good. It, it's, it's worth uh, working. See, like, this one's used, but this one right here is still brand new probably 50 years old. I think these are made by Millen. I'm just pointing this out because uh, uh, if you get old surplus stuff, it can be really valuable to you. The, the, the parts, some of the components. I mean, you might say, well, I don't want a capacitor that's 70 years old. You might have something there. But here's some uh, tectronic parts. I don't know if you've seen these before. you got to drill two holes and just punches down there. And then these are, these are like solder terminals. This is really dynamite stuff. Here's some some used ones that I've salvaged out of uh, oscilloscopes and, and whatever made by Tektronix. They were very good at that. And all they do, they, they lay these things out like this, and they just lay the wire in it. They don't bend it and wrap it like it's in a, you know, a World War II B-29 Super Fortress. I don't do that either. I just lay the wire in there. I make sure that it's properly positioned, and I solder it because when you build at home, you have to take things apart a lot of times because you make mistakes or you want to change components or whatever. And look at these beauties I just got in from France. I'm telling you, this is beginning to be a, a worldwide uh, event here. These are 3.2 microfarads at 2,000 volts because um, the other day when I raised the voltage on those electrolytics that are in series to form a non-polarized capacitor, they exploded and filled the whole room with white smoke. It was. It was a mess. Anyway, here's something. Look at this. I just got this the other day. See, there it is, 400 degrees. The only thing I don't like about it is when I'm holding it, I, I have to be careful I'm not pressing the buttons, especially lowering the temperature. But this thing was only like 12 or 14 bucks. I recommend this little guy. And I've got expensive uh, Weller soldering stations over there, but I'm telling you, that thing is quite nice, and it's really hot. 
Uh, here's another thing, related or not. Uh, I have been tinkering with uh, a few um, microwave transformers. I wanted to know what the inductance was on the secondary, the high voltage. This one's 20 Henry's. Now, if you put in 120 volts over here, and you start tinkering with the other side, you, that thing will kill you because there's 18, 1,500 to 2,000 volts depending on which one it is. So, these things are deadly. You, you, you want to be careful with them. One side is always grounded. That's the way they built these things. They just halfway rectify it. But what I, it was soldered right there. So I lifted it off and put a wire on it. So this is one side of the primary. It's not grounded anymore. I also did it to this one. I'm not using these at the moment. This one only measures 16 and a half Henry's. If you can see that. But I did it again how I lifted that wire off right there. Might be good to put a little piece of tape under it or something. If you actually wanted to use it as a high voltage transformer. And then here's a big guy. These are all microwave transformers. This guy right here, that must have been a real powerful one. I have not moved the, removed the wire from it yet. So that's why I have to put one side to ground. These two terminals are to light up the, the filament of that magnetron. This is the uh, magnetron filament right here. And uh, probably these right here are the magnetron filaments. On that one, I hope you can see all that. Uh, uh, this is a method I use to... Uh, i got to take the camera off here, but I want to show you this. I've shown this before, but I think this is worth uh, possibly seeing again. Here's how I measure inductance. I have a nice little inductance meter that does pretty darn good until I try to measure the inductance of uh, iron core inductors and, and it just doesn't work. Uh, let's see, we have to do a, a choir and then we can put this in high resolution. That thing will settle down. And what we do is we put in a frequency. I use 40 hertz. I always use 40 hertz at about 100 millivolts. Right there. That's the frequency, that's the voltage going in. We can read it several times. And then I have an Excel spreadsheet where I put all this information in. There's the 40 hertz, there's a 10,000 ohm resistor, this part of it. I'm not going to get into all the details of this right now. And then you put in the voltage across the inductor, and then you put in the voltage across another part of it, and then you put in the phase shift between them. And as you can see, this phase shift right there. You can move it, you can move these things around until you get it right at the peak. Or some people have suggested doing it at zero cross. You'll end up with the same numbers. In this case, I got 4.7 milliseconds. Assuming I got it exactly right. All I go and measured and got five. You know, you got to do what you can. 4.8, okay. And then you put those numbers in here. I'll change this 5 right here to 4.8, 4.8, and then the inductance is right there. See, that one's only 11.7, call it 12 Henry's, but that is quite a, uh, that's quite a serious 12 Henry choke right there, if that's what you wanted to use it for. The uh, the secondary over here and just forget the primary don't do anything to it don't short it that's for sure because if you short any of the secondaries you actually render the transformer uh, as the only inductance in it then is the leakage inductance so you don't want to do that you just leave these two open and you could use this side as a choke again these these are the filament windings to light the magnetron so you'd use either side of this and you'd want to you'd have to pull this wire loose right here and uh, insulate it. Now I realize some of you are going to say, well, you know, uh, the other end of this thing, is this thing really uh, uh, rated to uh, run above ground? See, this wire is actually going to run all the way underneath it. And there it is right there. And come back here to this side. And the answer is, well, I don't know. You know, do it at your own risk. Would I do it? Yeah, probably, if I needed it. So that is that. Uh, you need tools like micrometers. You need to measure your stuff. This is a really good one. Uh, it's got metric and SAE. Since I'm in the U.S., I like to use 
both. I use whatever is appropriate. Soldering stations, etc. I don't know what else to say. Uh, look here. Here's some inductors I just got in from my friend over in Poland. Actually, these are the uh, chokes I'm going to use right here. They measure out at 70 Henry's. These two right here are 5K to 8 ohms, and they are SE, single-ended transformers with a gap in them. So they can, use, they can be used directly in, in a left and right channel in a standard design SE amplifier. And these two right here are the same thing. But they are not gapped. And I, that's the way I ordered them. Uh, I think he did a beautiful job. I just got them in recently. At the moment, what I've decided to use on this one is this massive power transformer and I'm going to use the UTC transformers as the uh, plate matching. You know, the plate of the tube is loaded into this choke and then this choke is separated by these capacitors right here and connected as a impedance matching device to these UTC transformers. I have a, a really nice uh, UTC push-pull amplifier that I run EL34s in and I think it sounds really good but you know what I don't think it sounds as good I don't think it sounds as good as the SCT I'm loaning it to my friend right now who's a musician and I wanted him to uh, evaluate it and give me uh, his opinion of it I listened to it with him the other day and he has uh, the big Tecton speakers called Moabs and uh, he uses a uh, Macintosh 225 they both sound absolutely spectacular they're so alive so detailed and the SCT amplifier was just as detailed pretty amazing let me show you what I just got this is the amplifier I'm listening to right now I actually prefer it to my Macintosh stuff solid state and even the 275 it's just got a more live sound to it I've put some newer EL34s in it and some vintage 6SN7s as you can see. I reduced the negative feedback on this one to 7 dB and that woke it up a little bit. Now on another one with it I have some KT66s in a different, a different completely different amplifier but the same Williamson design. I, del I uh, completely remove all the negative feedback on it and I did not like the way it sounded at all. And this one uh, uses the uh, UTC LS57s and a, a voltage doubler. This is a 180 volt, 700 milliamp transformer. And the speakers that I'm very pleased with are these little guys right here. They're from uh, a company called Tecton. They're uh, 96 dB SPL, I believe. And uh, I think they sound excellent. So there you go. Just showing you what I got. I like to see what you guys have. This is, when I watch videos, this is the kind of stuff I look for. I'm using a, uh, a DAC right here made by uh, Blue Sound, I believe it is. I know it's a little dark there, but I run it uh, straight through this uh, equalizer and uh, into the amplifier. I don't have bass and treble controls anymore and, and all of my... Uh, Macintosh stuff down here is uh, sitting silent for the, for the moment. I've kind of abandoned it for right now. So I hope you enjoy these videos. And I will uh, have this other amplifier built hopefully in the next week or two. And uh, I hope it sounds as good as the 300B one. I'm, I'll get it back here in the, another week or so. But that is, it is an absolutely astounding sounding little 5 watt single-ended triode amp. Stay safe, my friends.